Welcome to Jim Cannell on Today. This is Bible study for the 21st century. Last week, we got into Matthew 18, where these very carnal disciples are asking Jesus, who's the greatest? Uh, translation, am I the greatest? I, I dealt with that one. But this precipitated Jesus, not only just putting a child in the midst and saying, gotta be like a little child, but he then begins to talk about children and we'll be looking today at that. We'll also be interviewing Brian Stiller from the World Evangelical Alliance. It's gonna be a great show. The work of the Word of God is stunningly remarkable. We must understand that God has placed His life codes of salvation and healing in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jim Cantillon is focused on the messages that God has communicated through the Bible to you and me. Today, it's more important for us now that we learn what God is saying to us. God has placed us here now to be examples and to share the good news of His work with the world today. If you've heard the Divine Mind speak to you through this program, then God has worked in amazing ways to reveal His Word. Remember that this program has cost, and we have been faithful to God to bring this program to you. If you want to give an offering in any amount, we would appreciate it. Send to Jim Cantillon today, PO Box 989, Burlington, Ontario, L7R3Y7. Or call us at 519-415-8341. Or simply visit jimcantillontoday.com. It's really terrific to sit down with Brian Stiller. I've done it many, many times over the years, but very seldom in the last few years when he has been fulfilling a very critical role in the world as a global ambassador for the World Evangelical Alliance. Uh, a lot of you have known him as the former president of the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada, as the former president of Tyndale University College and Seminary. Um, he has uh, had a big impact uh, nationally in Canada, for sure, uh, in his ministry. But this uh, role as global ambassador with the World Evangelical Alliance has seen him for the last several years all over the world. He's written this tremendous book, From Jerusalem to Timbuktu, a world tour, a world tour of the spread of Christianity. Uh, and I have read it with great interest. It's terrific. And Brian, I think the first question that any reader would ask is why Timbuktu? We, we understand Jerusalem, but why Timbuktu? You refer to it as a, sort of the center of gravity for the church worldwide. Why? It's a very interesting demographic reality. And my friend Todd Johnson, who heads up the Center for Global Christianity out of Boston, Gordon Conwell, uh, one day in reading his material, I came on this, and it's this. In 33 AD, of course, the center of Christianity was Jerusalem. Of course. The yeah. Holy Spirit came, the church has church yeah. begun. But the demographers are those who study population and the, and the population of Christians and other religions. What they have shown is that over the, 19, over the, the 2,000 years, if you look at the center of density of population, that's, that's critical, the center of the density of the population. Of course, it started in Jerusalem in 33 AD. And then as Paul and the missionaries went out through Asia Minor and through Turkey and through Italy and through Rome and through Spain and France and then up into England, that center of density moved out from Jerusalem um, over through Europe. Mm. The beginning of the last century, it was over around Spain because at that point now you've got a couple hundred years of Christianity going into Latin America and into North America. But then all of a sudden, in the middle part of the, night of the 20th century, that's, again, we're talking about the center of density yeah. of Christians. It begins to move down from, from Spain down into North Africa. And the reason is because we've had this explosion of Christian faith in what's called the Global South, which is Africa, Latin America, and Asia. And literally this last year, 
as the demographers looked at the center of the density of population of Christianity, it ended up in Timbuktu, which is a real city in Northwest Africa. It's a real city. It's sort of legendary for most people, but it's, it's an actual city. It is, and it was a city that had one of the greatest libraries of Christian literature in, in, the, uh, in the ancient world. And what, what, uh, what kind of Christianity uh, is represented there? Would it be Orthodox, not Orthodox, Evangelical, Roman Catholic? Or what would it be? Well, in, in Timbuktu, again, we aren't talking about Timbuktu as where the center of Christians are. Right. We're talking about the global center of density. Right, right. But in, in, uh, in Timbuktu, you have, you have strong Orthodox because yeah. the Orthodox Church was the one that came down both from Coptic in in in, uh, in Egypt and you have the uh, the Orthodox in in uh, Ethiopia and that was the the church that moved down into that area. And then over the last hundred years, you've had missions, uh, uh, Christian, uh, Protestant, evangelical missions, and Roman Catholic. So you have a mixture of those within Timbuktu. Now, North America, well, let's, let's, let's talk about the UK and America. Th these nations have seen themselves as the, traditionally, at least over the last few hundred years, the mission sending nations. And I think uh, many North American Christians would be surprised to hear that the critical mass of faith right now is in the Southern Hemisphere. That's right. Uh, England in the 1790s, William Carey, who was the father of missions, yeah. went to India, and that began, that, out of his initiative, the modern missions movement began. And you have mo mainly out of, out of, out of England, uh, the China Inland Mission, you have that beginning in the, in the late, 18, uh, late 1800s. So your, your main drive of Christian missions was out of England and then Europe, Germany, and so forth. But then in the early part of the 20th century, uh, you have the, the Americas begin to take over as the dominant missionary sending country. Um, today, you have Brazil and South Korea as being second and third as the major missionary sending countries in the world. Number one is? Uh, it's still the U.S. Still the U.S. That's right. But that's diminishing as a percentage of, the, of, of, of it overall. As the global south begins to drive missions, so for example, in China, you have what's called the Back to Jerusalem movement. Well, the Back to Jerusalem movement comes out of the underground, used to be called the underground church, now we call it the unregistered church, uh, or house church in China, and the, 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 number of, the numbers are, are huge. It, it could be totally, uh, total Christians, maybe 140 million. But what happens to the gospel when, it, when it's released into the lives of people, they then begin to think about others. And so it's, it's very intuitive especially as we've lived through a period of 100 years where we have understood the spirit in new ways. And we can talk about that later. But as that has exploded both the growth of the church in regions, it gives the missionary enterprise a, a whole new look. So the Chinese, as they have been evangelized themselves, they say, well, okay, we have to go into all the world. So the same gospel that we read, we read go into, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria, the other most parts of the world, they read the same text. So they saw, they saw themselves as being a, uh, a trigger for the movement of the gospel to Jerusalem, and, that, and for them, they mean over the Silk Road, moving right. across through Western China and into Asia Minor, through the Kazakhs, through the stands of, of, right. of around Russia, and over through to Jerusalem. So the back to Jerusalem movement isn't so much getting to Jerusalem as it is seeing from where they are to Jerusalem as being an untouched area. Now that corridor, if we can call it that, would be what? Relatively untouched these days with the gospel? Yes, you have, you've, had, uh, you have, you've had the dominant of Islam, you've had the Soviet Union, so when you get closer into Georgia and Kazakhstan and Tajikistan and so forth, and then you have Islam in, in Iraq and Iran, so you've had, in a sense, the gospel has been blocked out of many of those regions, even though there are underground movements, they've been generally blocked out, so the Chinese, and especially for them is the Western China, which is, which is, which is uh, Islamic dominated, so they see themselves as moving across that, that old Silk Road, which is being rejuvenated today, and they see that as a kind of a missionary enterprise, so the Back to Jerusalem movement, simply is an expression that shows the Chinese, as the rest of us, see missions as a mandate of the Spirit. Who knew? 
My, my wife's parents were on their way to uh, China in missions back in the, uh, I think it was just right after the Second World War, somewhere in the late 40s, and they were cut off by Mao Zedong and, and, and his purge of Christianity from China. They ended up in Argentina, where they had a great ministry, but who would have thought back in those days that China would become such a great mission sending? Also, I, I've heard various uh, uh, stats from various experts. I remember years before, just, just a few months ago, before he, uh, a few months before he died, a few years back, I interviewed Chuck Colson, and he was very interested in, in, in China, and he, off camera, told me there were an, uh, maybe as many, if not more, believers in China than in America. Was, was that an overstatement? Uh, it 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 requires a bit of unwrapping. Yeah. Uh, when you look at the U.S., 30, 330 million, uh, you've got 27 percent Catholic and about a 33 percent uh, Evangelical Protestant. So when you look at those numbers, yeah. people, so self-identified Americans who say that they're Christian, uh, and you take put that up against China. I suppose your numbers would be closer to equal, but in China, you've got a resilient, dynamic church that wouldn't be the same as you have in the U.S. You've met more than once with the uh, minister of religion. Is that what they call him in China? Or the, yes. The guy overseeing it's religion? It's called SARA, S-A-R-A, -A, and that's an acronym for, for the religious association. Uh, what, what, what's your impression of your meeting with him? Well, it's very interesting. Uh, we're taking into the Forbidden City, which is the which is the the, the great ancient uh, uh, center of, of of power of of, of China. Uh, the the rituals, the the uh, the ceremonies, they they treat you with with great care and and in interest. Uh, and you, you sit alongside and they bring their people and you bring your people in and you're sitting there and you have conversation for about an hour and a half. And the conversation uh, begins politely, uh, but you know that they are, that you're being watched wherever you go yeah. and they, they have their heavy file on you. Uh, the, the, the director of the China Christian, uh, the, 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 the Chinese, church, Christian church, that person came and visited me here in Canada. So they had the background on, of that. on who I yeah, was. Yeah. And they, they are concerned because our, you have both the registered and the unregistered church. And the unregistered church is what we used to call the underground church. Right. But the underground church isn't, doesn't necessarily have to be underground as it once was. But what the government wants, they have this this, this major department called SERA, which oversees all religion. And you've got all the religions that have different departments, and you've got the Catholics and then the Christians. So Christians are called different than Catholics. And the Christians are Protestants, mainly evangelical. So from their point of view, there is a Protestant uh, uh, Roman Catholic divide. Oh yes, they're different churches. Yeah. And because, see, the Roman Catholics have a capital city, which is called the Vatican. Right. So the, there's a political liaison uh, with, with the, there's a merging of the church and politics as far as the, the Catholics are concerned, because remember that a Catholic priest is ultimately subservient to the, the Pope, who is head of a political entity called the Vatican. Right. So the, for, the, for the Chinese, that it gives them great concern that a religious leader in China is ultimately subservient to a person outside of China who's not only a religious leader but a political leader. And so for them, it's, there's a great concern that the, China, that the Catholics in China not be subservient to Rome. So it's a different kind of... Okay. Uh, now, as you know, friends, uh, I spread these interviews out over the course of four weeks programming per month. And Brian is going to be back with me, God willing, next week. Uh, we haven't really covered China fully yet. I'm going to pick up with more about China when we return next week with this ongoing interview. Uh, don't miss it and uh, record this one and keep, a track, keep track of these things. They're, they're absolutely fascinating. You're hearing from a guy who has a perspective on the growth of the church in the world like nobody else I know. We'll take a little break and I'll be back with our um, journey through the Gospels right after this.
Remote and rural, these children and their families have no access to medical care. There is no clinic nearby. And when a mother is desperate to save her dying child, she will walk for many hours. Sometimes the child doesn't survive. So we go to them. These tables and chairs under the trees look like a gathering, not a medical clinic. But the doctors and nurses are transforming the lives of the children and their families. They provide primary medical care, classes on sanitation, medicines, and a better understanding of HIV and AIDS. Most of all, they bring hope as they diagnose, treat, and educate families. This clinic is a gift from donors that will transform their lives. You can become part of that transformation. Your gift of $25 will provide health care for an entire family. $100 provides care for six families. Be a part of real change. Go to wowmission.ca slash save a child. I read this passage last uh, show, but I, I need to refresh your memory here. Jesus is talking about children, and in Matthew 18, verse 6, he says, Whoever be causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come, but woe to the, that man by whom the offense comes. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off, cast it from you. It's better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Jesus often used hyperbole. You remember from your high school English lessons that hyperbole is um, exaggeration and if, trying to have an effect beyond its, uh, its cause because you're just trying to make a point. Um, here Jesus is into talking about children. And he said to his disciples who, whose egos were demanding that Jesus tell them who of them was the greatest. And he got beyond that, saying you've got to be like a little child. And now he's going on about children. And uh, he says in verse 7, Woe to the world. I talked about the millstone last time, by the way, so I, I won't rehearse that. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. Um, he's talking here about the... Um, in the context, sins against children. And uh, he's basically saying, boy, the world's in trouble because there's offenses against children going on everywhere. And uh, you, can't help, you can't be held responsible for the sins against children of others, but woe to you if that sin against a child comes to you or is uh, committed by you. A uh, very succinct warning. Uh, and he, he's also suggesting that, you know, as a child grows, because we're all born in sin, uh, the child grows into adolescence and adulthood, you know, as he says, temptations will come. In other words, yes, even these little ones will one day be committing sin. But, and there's a big but, if anyone is responsible for imprinting that child with sinful behavior, woe to them. Now, I'm not going to get into sexual abuse of children other than to say that often the sexual imprint that is made on a child's psyche by a predatory adult literally bends them for the rest of their lives. It doesn't necessarily defeat them. But there's always going to be a limp, if you will, as they walk through life. Just the way it is. I, I was thinking, uh, as I was studying this some time back, and there was a news item about um, an actor who shall remain nameless with a major uh, television show that was popular with young people. Uh, he had just committed suicide. What they discovered was 50,000 pictures and hundreds of videos on his laptop, some with little girls as young as three to five years of age. He was huge into child porn, and who knows what else he may have been doing. But he committed suicide, and I would call this a self-inflicted millstone. 
Jesus says, you harm one of these little ones, it's better a millstone is tied around your neck and you're cast in the depths of the Sea of Galilee and just plummet to the bottom. Well, sometimes we, in our guilt, will put a millstone around our necks ourselves and end it all. And that's what happened with this guy. It's a sad tale. Look, Jesus is saying, We're all guilty of offense, except Jesus himself, of course. Um, and if indeed it's your hand or your foot that's causing you to sin, <laughs> cut it off, cast it from you. Better to enter into life lame or maimed than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Now, this is hyperbolic. But it shows Jesus' anger at those who in any way harm children. Uh, child porn, for example. I mean, that, that, I, I don't know if it gets any more harmful than that, than the concomitant uh, actual physical abuse of children that often accom you know, accompanies uh, child porn. The Jewish view at Jesus' time saw the most unforgivable of sins was to teach someone else to sin. And especially if it was a little kid. Not just because they're a little kid, but then they will learn this bad behavior and they will teach someone else. And they will teach someone else. And there will be this domino effect that will go maybe on and on for centuries. Who knows? We've got to take ourselves seriously when it comes to influencing others negatively. And we may have every reason under the sun why we are doing so, apart from our own lust and selfishness. But if we cause someone to sin, especially if it's a child, we are treading on very, very thin ice. And Jesus is being very strong here. He's saying, you're heading for everlasting fire. And so the hyperbolic statement is, if it's your hand that's causing you to do it or your foot that's causing you to do it, cut it off. He knows full well it's the brain that causes us to sin. The hand, the foot is just a servant of the brain. So he's not, he doesn't want a bunch of disfigured disciples following him around. Come on. But he's pointing out the fact that there is very little, price, very little in life that's more valuable than the heart and the soul of a child. And so whatever you need to do to avoid uh, imprinting them, sinfully avoid it. Okay, let's move on. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, cast it from, uh, Same point, okay? Uh, verse 10, take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now, uh, let, let's, let's stop there for a moment. They're angels? Well, we know from the book of Revelation, chapter 2, that the seven churches had angels. Uh, we know from Job 33, verse 23, that he had an angel. And we know that Peter, Acts 12, 15, had an angel. So, we can't say that this idea is uh, off the wall. I don't understand it. I don't know if anybody has ever, you know, successfully, you know, delved into the depths of angelology, although there is such a discipline in theology. But nevertheless, here you have it. And I, I think... I can say this without being presumptuous. I think that the administration of the presence of God in some ways has been downloaded by our Heavenly Father to angels. Now, I am not for a moment going to encourage uh, angel worship. There's no biblical um, doctrine that even comes close suggesting that, although some heresies over the years have gone into that kind of thing. Some aspects of the early Gnostic heresy, for instance, in the early church uh, got into the 
worship of angels. But there's, um, there's a case to be built here. People will say, you know, I, I, I almost uh, was killed, but my guardian angel protected me. Well, I've heard enough of those stories to say, yeah, I hear you. Uh, I'm not going to um, distract the essential uh, DNA of my faith by, you know, chasing that rabbit hole, uh, that rabbit trail down the hole. But I still believe that there is a strong case for this. And why not? He will give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Cantillon's Casual Commentary, Volume 2, is here. The focus of this book is Matthew chapters 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount called the greatest sermon of all time. Gain background and insight into the Beatitudes, being salt and light, how to love your enemies, and the Lord's Prayer. We'd like you to have your copy of Cantillon's Casual Commentary, Volume 2. If you're already a monthly partner, it will be sent out to you automatically in the next few weeks. If you would like to order Volume 2, you can do so by sending a gift in any amount. Call us at 519-415-8341 or write to Jim Cantillon today, P.O. Box 989, Burlington, Ontario, L7R3Y7 or visit us online at jimcantillontoday.com. Request Cantillon's Casual Commentary Volume 2 and it will be sent to you. You know, friends, you can see for yourself, uh, JCT, which is a low budget program, has very high production values and has a very high uh, vision for just in a verse by verse, integral, authentic kind of way to bring you the scriptures, also to bring you people like Brian Stiller, who have a proven track record in Christian ministry. And I will continue to do that as long as we're supported. Send in for these, send some support, let's make it happen. See you next time. Contact us. Jim Cantillon today. P.O. Box 989, Burlington, Ontario. L7R 3Y7. If you're sending a check, make it payable to Jim Candle on Today. Or visit us online at jimcandleontoday.com and click support. Mm -hmm.